Sigmund Freud is widely known for his psychoanalytic approach. He's associated with padded couches, dream analysis, and a loose psychiatrist obsessed with sex. Yet Freud didn't set out to create a personality theory, develop therapeutic techniques, or establish a school of psychotherapy. He didn't even want to be a clinician. He wanted to be a scientist. But the anti-Semitic culture of his day made that impossible. Jews could mostly work and live freely in Vienna, but not in high-prestige jobs. After being repeatedly rejected for academic positions, Freud began a medical practice specializing in neurology. In the late 1800s, science was focused on identifying invisible structures. Chemicals were defined in terms of elements. Atomic weights were charted, and magnetic and electric forces were delineated. So it's not surprising that the study of the mind followed a similar path. Freud believed he discovered mental structures and the forces that flow between them. Think of it as a boiler system, where steam is pushed from place to place, builds up pressure, and looks for ways to release it. Freud believed these structures and forces control all human behavior. People don't have free will or choice. Behavior is the result of unseen, unlearned, and unconscious processes. Freud proposed three structures, the id, ego, and superego. The id is the earliest and most basic component of personality. At birth, a baby is only an id. A baby has wants and needs but can't express them in words. In Freud's system, anything that can't be verbalized is unconscious. When the id wants something, it wants it immediately. It works on the pleasure principle. Whatever gives pleasure is good. And since it can't consciously express itself, the id generates an image of the object it desires. But it cannot satisfy its needs itself. The id is completely unconscious and needs the ego to deal with reality. The ego is Freud's second structure. It operates on the reality principle. What is real is good. Together, the ego and id form a yin-yang relationship. The id generates psychic energy, called libido, and creates an image of what it wants. The ego regulates the energy and searches reality for something that will satisfy the id. Although the two processes complement each other, it's an inexact match. The ego can't always find what the id wants, so it tries to substitute. Think of a crying baby and you're trying to make it stop crying. Is this what you want? You ask. Is this what you want? Life would be much easier if the id could talk. As it learns right from wrong, the ego creates a third mental component, a superego. Like the id, the superego can't distinguish imagined from real, and consequently it punishes you equally for a bad idea or for a bad action. Composed of the conscience, what you should not do and the ego ideal, what you should do. The superego is in direct opposition to the id, what you want to do. The conflict produced by the fighting of the id and superego is called anxiety. For Freud, human behavior is a function of the ego mediating between the forces of the id and superego. Psychoanalysis is the analysis of the psyche, the mind. The goal is to identify how your inner structures relate to each other. This isn't something you can do yourself. You need a trained analyst to guide you through the process. The assumption is that only Freud was able to do this on his own. You lie on a couch, sort of a leather chaise lounge, and say anything that comes into your mind. No guidance is given, so this is free association. You're free to say whatever is in your conscious. This is thought to give voice to the id, which is totally unconscious, and to the portion of the superego that is unconscious. But it's a difficult process. The ego doesn't want to release the information. It wants to avoid anxiety. So the ego puts up resistance. The analyst analyzes the defenses of the ego and helps guide you to the underlying truths hidden in your unconscious, primarily painful experiences from your childhood. Freud suggests that all current problems are based in childhood. Initially, psychoanalysis involved an intensive investment of time. Patients were required to see their analysts for an hour a day, every day, six days a week, for a year or more. Following this intensive analysis, psychoanalytic psychotherapy involved a weekly, hour-long session for as long as needed, usually years. In general, we can summarize Freud's work in nine assumptions. Freud's model assumes that personal observation is acceptable data on which to base a theory. He assumes that he is competent to analyze his own dreams and inner psychic structures, but that others are not able to do so. Supposedly, most of the mind, including Freud's, is unconscious. Yet Freud assumes he was able to discover that it exists and how it works. 
Freud assumes there are internal mental structures that cannot be proven. He assumes a theory can contain intervening variables and should not be restricted or reduced to observable, measurable units. He assumes that psychological concepts, such as the Oedipus complex, can be derived from myths. He assumes that people do not have a free choice, but everything is determined. He assumes that personality develops over time, but can be changed, although it's a slow process. Freud assumes that mental processes are physiologically based. This applies to personality and to psychosexual stages of development. In today's terms, Freud grew up in a dysfunctional family, experimented with cocaine, and died as a result of euthanasia. He was an intelligently gifted overachiever who terminated even long-term relationships when his authority was challenged. He had a quick wit, worked hard, and was an exceptionally good writer. He was moody, ultra-introspective, and held extremely negative views toward sex. He was not a rigorous scientist, yet he provided the first scientifically deterministic model of human personality and development. Although Freud was science-oriented, his theory was primarily autobiographical. His theory isn't very predictive, but has been used extensively to explain behavior. Although his theory of personality has been largely replaced or discounted, it would be difficult to imagine a history of psychology or a discussion of personality without the mention of Sigmund Freud.